The issue is not quantity, but quality. Scripture demands a perfect sacrifice. No rabbi, no concentration camp victim, no man is perfect unless the claims of Christianity are believed. Shalom and welcome to Crosstalk International. I'm Josh Weiss, and right now, we're in the middle of a series based on a book by my father, Dr. Randy Weiss, titled, God, Forgive Me? This is episode eight, and if you missed any of the earlier episodes, don't worry, you can find them all on our YouTube page. In the last episode, Dad was just about to start talking about a Jewish service called Kol Nidre, but we ran out of time. So that's where we're picking up today. Let's jump right in. Kol Nidre literally means all oaths and they're revoked on Erev Yom Kippur. The evening when the holiday begins, we hear Kol Nidre chanted. The name is translated as all vows and it is from this prayer that the Kol Nidre service gets its name. It is intoned with a solemn melody and the intensity of the moment echoes in the soul. This famous prayer is actually an Aramaic legal formula that annuls all unresolved vows that were made during the year. It is a protection against rash or coerced oaths that cannot or should not be fulfilled. Several explanations for the prayer exist. The most compelling reminds us of when the Visigoth Catholics forced Jews to convert to Christianity during the persecutions of the Byzantine Empire from the year 700 to 850 of the Common Era. Again, during the later Spanish Inquisition from 1391 to 1492, Jews were violently compelled to convert under the threat of death. As a result of these atrocities, the Kol Nidre prayer was added to bring forgiveness to those Jews who made such oaths that violated their true faith and Jewish law. The Catholic demand of coerced conversions and being forcibly baptized haunted many Jews for the rest of their days. Oaths made under duress were for survival, not spiritual salvation. The Kol Nidre prayer was to absolve such Jews of the horribly unfortunate decisions they had made. Tragically, this resulted in more anti-Semitic attacks. Instead of showing compassion for Jews in their attempt to make peace with God and, and man, more hatred was manufactured. The Kol Nidre prayer brought more accusations against Jews, specifically uh, using the prayer to cheat non-Jews. It's a lie. The claims indicted us of intentionally violating agreements on the skirts of this prayer. The prayer was their evidence that the oath of a Jew is worthless. How ugly, how, how untrue. It seems that throughout history, our enemies have looked for excuses to despise us. We've been maligned, misunderstood, and treated as society's scapegoat. So let's consider Azazel, our scapegoat. Here's a question. What is a scapegoat? Well, here's the answer. As a literal term, it is a goat that escaped. But figuratively, it is usually understood as a term to describe an innocent victim wrongly blamed for the actions of others. Often, it is due to the intentional shifting of blame to innocent individuals who cannot defend themselves against the culprits who are actually guilty. The purpose of creating a scapegoat in a troubled society, as happened to the Jews in Nazi Germany, is to create psychological relief by suggesting that ridding society of the scapegoated victim will restore order when things have gone badly. Let's unpack the true original meaning of the term. The Bible presents the first example of a scapegoat in the character known as Azazel. A definition of this obscure Hebrew term may prove helpful. Azazel is a demonic figure to whom the sin-laden scapegoat was sent on the day of atonement. The Hebrew word has been traditionally understood as a phrase meaning the goat that escapes, giving us the word scapegoat. But in light of modern research, both this interpretation and those that understood it as a place name are incorrect. The word is something like angry God 
Yet, though Azazel is a demon, he does not play an active role in the rite as corresponding figures do in similar rituals of the ancient Near East. In some ancient Jewish writings, Azazel is characterized in the most ominous terms. The book of Enoch presents a spiritual war between the angels of God and evil demons. Azazel is therein closely identified with the devil. Pirkei de Rabbi Eliezer considers Azazel an actual alias of Satan. I particularly like the creative trickery suggested by the rabbi. Bereshit Rabbatai and Yalmut Shimoni appear to understand that there is a literal transfer of sins. The booby-trapped goat carries the sins back to their originator, who was ultimately responsible for the entire world's transgressions. However one chooses to interpret the personage of, or purpose of Azazel, according to the Yom Kippur Torah reading from Leviticus chapter 16, one of the two goats described through Moses was sent to Azazel. Moses informs us that two goats were chosen by Aaron. After casting lots, one goat was presented to the Lord and sacrificed as a sin offering. The other goat, Azazel, was released into the wilderness. The Mishnah proposes that after the high priest symbolically transferred all the sins of the Jewish people to the scapegoat, the goat destined for Azazel was driven into the wilderness and cast over a precipice to its death. Sin creates a circumstance that demands a sacrifice to obtain forgiveness. According to the Hebrew Bible, that usually meant something or someone must die. As suggested in this discussion and my book's subtitle, I believe death is still a requirement. The challenge for people who believe the Bible is that all such forms of legitimate animal sacrifices were discontinued with the destruction of the temple as prophesied by Jesus shortly before his crucifixion. This fact was mentioned earlier and deserves additional explanation. When confronted by the religious leaders who opposed Jesus, Famous conflicts arose between Jesus and his detractors. He was known to disapprove of certain traditions that had been inappropriately exalted by some rabbis of his day. Numerous heated debates ensued as recorded in the New Testament. Sometimes these happened in and around the temple. In his famous Olivet Discourse, Jesus had left the temple. His disciples wanted to make sure that the beauty and majesty of Herod's construction of the new temple in Jerusalem had not been lost on Jesus. They were impressed. Jesus was not. And as they sat across the tiny valley from the temple on the Mount of Olives, Jesus took the opportunity to explain that the entire religious house of cards was going to come crashing down. The temple was at the center of Jewish life. It was the crown jewel of Rome's Jerusalem. It was the financial hub of the region. The economy of Jerusalem was fueled by the pilgrims who were required to annually flock to the temple, to yield their offerings, and to fund the animal sacrifices that purchased their atonement. The temple had been the most stable and enduring symbol of the Jewish people's connection to God. So one can only imagine the shock felt by the followers of Jesus when he calmly declared that the temple would soon be destroyed. It was completely unrealistic. It was destabilizing. And it was politically incorrect to suggest what seemed like an absurd concept. Yet that is precisely what he prophesied. And it was precisely what happened a few decades after he was crucified. Sacrifices ceased. Temple Judaism died. Jesus rose from the grave and was made known to the world as the living example of God's love and the perfect sacrifice once and for all who believed. In this miraculous revelation, Jesus became the light to the Gentiles. Through Jesus, Israel's God was broadly embraced by those who lived outside of Judaism and was successfully made known to the non-Jewish world. Exactly as Jesus foretold, the temple was so devastatingly destroyed that not one stone was left standing on top of another after the Roman army sacked Jerusalem. 
Through archaeological excavation, one can now go underground to see parts of the foundation upon which the temple had originally been built. But the temple is only a tragic memory of Israel's failure. As is known to anyone who has seen the religious sites of modern Jerusalem, a remnant of the outer wall that surrounded the temple's courtyard remains as an inspirational holy place where pilgrims pray, cry, and celebrate Israel's modern day freedom. But it is certain that the startling words of Jesus were true. The popular tourist site, now known as the Western Wall, was never a wall of Israel's ancient temple. It is one more prophetic fulfillment of the words of Jesus. Nothing remains of the temple where we presume to house our God. In a quirky, irreverent sort of way, I would say, God was released from the grip of temple Judaism and freed to be embraced by those outside of Judaism. Jesus made that introduction possible. Just as the Bible foretold, the non-Jews have been welcomed into relationship with Israel's God. The Jewish Messiah has been received by people of nearly every nation, and the people of God can finally recognize that Jesus checks the boxes that described our Messiah foretold in the Bible. The most important messianic purpose fulfilled was providing atonement for sin, carrying our guilt to his death, affected the sacrificial atonement required to pay the ransom to free us from the penalty of sin. Jews and Christians who value the teachings of Jesus recognize the unarguable fact that the knowledge of Israel's God has been widely declared across most of the world. The God of the Jewish Bible has been made known to Gentiles around the globe. This is a remarkable reality to consider. It is a miracle. Even people who hate the Jews love our God. People who have never met a Jew worship the God of the Jewish scriptures. Our God has become their God, and it is all because of a Jewish man born 2,000 years ago in ancient Israel. Christianity is the vehicle that our God deployed to reveal himself to the Gentiles. As a result, the Gentiles in enormous numbers now know the God of Israel. This was one of the most important elements of miraculous messianic prophecy. The Hebrew prophets foretold this aspect of our promised Messiah. The Bible declared that our Messiah would be a light to the nations. Literally in Hebrew, the Goyim, the Gentiles. Through the Hebrew prophet Isaiah, we learn that God called him a light to the Gentiles, that thou mayest be my salvation unto the ends of the earth. This is indisputably a messianic fulfillment. Jesus has unquestionably completed this important element of Jewish prophecy. He is the Moshiach HaGoyim, the Messiah of the Gentiles. As Isaiah declared, the light of God's love has reached the Goyim, the nations. The Gentiles know our God. Through Christ, the light has come, exactly as the Hebrew prophet declared, Arise, shine, for thy light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people. But the Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee, and the Gentiles shall come to thy light. As a result of Christianity, the God of Israel has been made known beyond Judaism and outside the boundaries of Israel because of Jesus, the God of Israel, is finally known as the creator of the world. The Bible proclaims our Savior to all men and women of all races and national origins. The non-Jews were not easily welcomed into the fraternal enclave of temple Judaism. The atoning work achieved through the sacrificial system held redemption as a privilege of the Jewish faithful. The Gentiles were outsiders to our covenant with God and to God's temple. 
I mean, it's understandable why confusion surfaced among the religious leaders when suddenly the temple was gone. Yet our sin problem remained. And adding to the complexities, non-Jews were being embraced by the Jewish believers in Jesus. The rabbis faced a sea change of religious turmoil. The complexion of first century Judaism had to adjust. One scholar suggests that Talmudic theoreticians needed to adapt customs developed at a time when the people worshipped and sacrificed in the temple to new times in which ritual was but a memory, and they had to learn how to perpetuate temple traditions without resorting to empty, imitative rituals. Let me say that the theoreticians succeeded in persuading Jewish followers that their strategy was worth trying. But in my opinion, their adaptations failed to transcend resorting to empty, imitative rituals. For example, were it not for a sin bearer like Azazel, how would our sin burdens be carried? With, without a sacrificial sin offering or a scapegoat, how would we cast off the guilt associated with our sins? The rabbis seem to have missed the point and their view became heavily blurred. As I referenced earlier, for early Judaism, the atonement base was broadened to include the sacrifice of martyrs whose achievements were calculated and deemed meritorious for others. So let me talk a little more about martyrology and human sacrifice. Modern Jews tend to reject the idea of sacrifice. Human sacrifice is particularly offensive. Nevertheless, there is a view toward the death of Jewish martyrs as serving in an atoning capacity for the rest of our people. This was shown in a previous text where Eleazar was reported to have said, Be merciful unto thy people and let our punishment be a satisfaction in their behalf. Make my blood their purification and take my soul to ransom their souls. Again, that was from 4th Maccabees, Jewish literature. One section of the Yom Kippur liturgy presents another illustration. Consider the words of Jewish scholar Michael Strassfeld regarding the fascinating Yom Kippur prayer service focused on martyrology. It describes how many famous Talmudic sages were cruelly martyred by the Romans during the reign of Hadrian. While the text tells their fate as though they were all killed at the same time, in fact, the killings took place over a period of time, it is speculated that this section is recited on Yom Kippur to ask God to have mercy on Israel because of the ultimate sacrifice in God's honor made by these sages. One curious Midrash states that God allowed the sages to be killed as a punishment for the sin of Joseph's ten brothers. Strasfeld continued his explanation about the Jewish concept of atonement within martyrology by saying, recently some congregations and prayer books have revised the martyrology by adding to it material related to the Holocaust. For me at least, the flaw in these arguments do not relate to the concept of sacrifice, not even human sacrifice. In fact, if a goat or bull could be effective in taking away sins, why not a Jewish martyr? Some Jews still have hope in the blood of the martyrs. The, the argument that I must raise opposing this view is not related to the concept of the sacrifice itself. Rather, it relates to the condition of the sacrifice. Remember, if it was not a perfect sacrifice, it was not an effective sacrifice. Human sacrifice is certainly not a pleasant consideration. Though distasteful, it has been shown that it is not foreign to a Jewish frame of reference. The issue lies within the acceptability of the sacrifice. If there was a blemish on the subject to be offered, then the sacrifice was not acceptable to God. And after all, it is God who remains the judge to be appeased. Any animal intended for sacrifice was carefully inspected by qualified priests prior to ritual slaughter. 
As distasteful as it seems, if a human sacrifice were to be offered, logic dictates that he or she would also need to be unblemished, at least in a spiritual sense. Sinlessness limits the pool of prospective candidates to provide atonement through sacrifice. So I must ask what sacrifice is effective. And I'm pleased to report that dialogue between Jews and Christians has drawn people of faith closer together. Agreement is not a prerequisite for dialogue, and we should not fear disagreement. As I know that some who hear my words will not agree with my conclusions, I appreciate that my conclusions are at least considered. And likewise, I've carefully and respectfully considered the views of Jewish scholars who differ with my beliefs. I must still ask the difficult question, what is the appropriate solution for the sin problem in Judaism? A larger sacrifice won't get the job done or be sufficient to honor God in a way that is pleasing to Him. It, the Bible says, all of Lebanon's forests do not contain sufficient fuel to consume a sacrifice large enough to honor Him. Christianity presumes that God prepared His own sacrifice in a fashion that also avoided burning down the beautiful cedars of Lebanon. Within the Christian belief system, Jesus, the Messiah, is seen as God's own provision of an acceptable sacrifice to make atonement for the sins of Jews and Gentiles. Therein, Jesus is seen as the one given to be, quote, the light of the nations, that my salvation may be unto the end of the earth, unquote. Therefore, the Christian view proposes that God intended to draw near to the Jews, but additionally, he also wanted to reach out to other people. His love has been shown through Jesus as the Lamb of God, the perfect sacrifice. Judaism attempts to solve the sin problem through fasting, prayer, kaporos, martyrology, or happy thoughts that God wouldn't really condemn a sinner to hell. Fasting and prayer are insufficient. Kaporos is purely symbolic of a valid missing sacrifice. It is not an actual or acceptable sacrifice. Martyrology fails on the lack of perfection of the martyr who lost his or her life. No basis exists to presume that God would accept the unclean sacrifice of a blemished subject, even if that subject was a brilliant sage. Neither would it be effective if that subject was a group of imperfect medieval Jewish sages. Most tragically, it would still not be effective even if the subjects equated to six million imperfect Jewish victims of Hitler's rage and insanity. The issue is not quantity, but quality. Scripture demands a perfect sacrifice. No rabbi, no concentration camp victim, no man is perfect unless the claims of Christianity are believed. We profess that the perfect man was the perfect lamb. Our atonement was secured through the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish, without spot. Whether one believes in hell or not, most folks do want to experience a pleasant afterlife. As others have said many times, everyone wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die. So, while we live, it makes sense to live well, and it is reasonable to not take chances with our afterlife. Therefore, Bible-believing Jews and Christians often reflect on what they think God requires to find eternal peace after they leave this world. For Jews, there's a bottom line to Torah adherence. The precise language of the punishments associated with disobeying God's Sabbath and or His Yom Kippur commands are sobering. Reconsider the words of Rabbi Steinsaltz. He said the violation of the Sabbath laws is punishable by execution by an earthly court, while the violation of the Yom Kippur laws is punishable by excision. Rabbinic Judaism has sought its own method of circumventing the punishment. Their method is creative, but is it effective? Every Gentile and every Jew has broken the law. Every Gentile and every Jew should be concerned about the result. It is tragic that anyone would violate God's edict and fail to find true atonement or 
seek a scapegoat. Fasting removes pounds, not sins. We need a sacrifice. Rabbinic Judaism suggests that their checklist of rituals will satisfy God when called upon to provide an answer for our sins. The Holy Scriptures do not make a convincing case for that view. As a youth, I was convinced of that practice. Today, I cannot attribute any confidence to that theory. I love the tradition, but I cannot base my destiny on the decisions of the rabbis. Some authoritative rabbis have agendas to protect while others are well-meaning, but they themselves are unsure. Knowing and respecting the traditions enabled me to please my parents and look good in synagogue, but the traditions had no power to keep me from sin, and I now believe that they had no power to overcome the results of sin. My book and my presentation herein asks the fundamental question, will God forgive me? And the answer is yes, sure, certainly, but something or someone must die. My answer to this complex question offers a simple yet justifiable conclusion. The Bible presents incontrovertible evidence that sin creates guilt for the person who sinned. God and biblical Judaism demanded a guilt offering to be sacrificed to atone for one's sins to remove his or her guilt. That guilt offering was an animal, an unblemished animal. The Bible says, in the place where they kill the burnt offering, shall they kill the guilt offering, and the blood thereof shall be dashed against the altar round about. Guilt from sin creates a bloody mess in many ways. It destroys families. It robs us of our peace with God. And if no acceptable atonement is found, it leads to severe judgment from God. None of us want that type of relationship with the judge. The solution found in biblical Judaism is no longer within our reach. There is no temple in which to kill the guilt offering. Because there is no temple, therefore, there is no altar upon which to dash the blood. Later, rabbinic Judaism crafted a bloodless tradition. Unfortunately, such a plan is sterile yet ineffective from a biblical perspective. Without Shedding of blood is no remission, for the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that maketh atonement by reason of the life. Christianity posits that though the temple is gone, atonement is available. It is reasonable to presume that God would not leave his people without a means to secure atonement. Well, unfortunately, that's all we have time for today. But rest assured, we'll pick up right where we left off in the next episode. Until next time, shalom and God bless.